Cool. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Ben. I'm from the Sea Cadets. I'm Chief Instructor of the Midlands Boat Station. Um, I'm just here to introduce um, so um, to tonight's webinar on the BP careers. Um, so the way this will work is um, Catherine and a few other panelists will go through some slideshows and um, take a bit of time explaining about the BP. And then at the end, there'll be a Q&A. There is a Q&A function um, on the bottom. So you can ask questions throughout, but they'll most likely be answered at the end. But if you, you can put them in, um, so that way um, everyone can see them. I have been asked um, just to, if people could just say their, um, type their name in the Q&A and which unit they're from. Um, only um, we'll be able to see it, so don't worry, um, not everyone will be able to see it, it's just so we get a register. So just your name and which unit you're from. Um, cool. So I'll just hand over to Catherine now and she'll get us all started. Super. Thanks ever so much, Ben. Good evening, everybody. I'm Catherine Hibbert and I am one of the recruiters at BP. Um, I am currently managing an, an active campaign to hire 10 cadets into our BP Marine Services uh, from, for, our, for September. So I guess this evening I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, about a career in, in shipping, introduce you to some of our cadets um, who can, I guess, bring to life uh, what you know what their experiences are uh, being a being a, a shipping cadet, either as a, a deck cadet, an engineer cadet, or a, an electro technical cadet. Um, I'm also brought along one of our, uh, our our tanker managers, Danny, who is going to talk to you a bit about his career and and how that's gone from being a cadet to where he is today and all the positions that he's been through. So that'll give you a, a bit of a flavour of um, of what a, an entire career might look like. Um, in, in, in maritime. So I'm going to cover uh, a little bit about, you know, have you got what it takes? Uh, you know, what, what are we looking for in someone to be a cadet? You know, what sort of soft skills would you need to have? Um, and, you know, and in, in, in return for those soft skills, you know, what would you get to experience um, as, as a cadet? And then we can talk to you a bit more about, uh, you know, what the format of the of the, the, the sponsorship is both at, at college and what life at sea might look like. You can get to meet some of our cadets, uh, past and current, who can talk to you a bit in a bit more depth about those three pathways, um, and also, you know, in real life, what they get to experience. Um, you know, and I've asked them to be really honest. You know, it's it's not about painting a beautiful oil painting. It's about telling you the good bits, but also the, the real challenges that they have to go through. So, you know, if you are considering a life at sea, you know. I've, is, is, is it for you? Um, so I want them to be really honest about that. And then you can, um, you can have, a, have a, a chat to Danny. He can talk a little bit more about, um, I guess, all of, the, all of the safety and sort of the, the personal protective equipment that you might have to wear. It's, you know, it's not glamorous on board, I'm afraid. Um, and also all the different sort of levels of people. So, so typically on a ship, um, all the different types of people that you would get to work with. Um, then I'll talk a bit more about, you know, if you do decide that a career at sea is something for you, um, you know, what a, what a standard application process might look like and also how to ace that application and assessment process as well. Uh, so giving you a few hints and tips and then we'll open up to, to the Q&A. Um, but just really keen to understand um, if there's anything else that you would like us to cover um, tonight, if you've got any questions, then pop them in the chat, uh, the chat box, and uh, and Greg can share those with us. So tonight, as I said, we've got uh, we've got Danny Middle, who is an LNG vessel manager, joining us. Um, so you've got myself, um, Catherine, and then we've got Jess, Elisa. Bradley, Harry and Sam and Elio as well, who is our, our poster boy here tonight, um, who are all going to be, be presenting and available for Q&As at the end of the session. But I think 
First, first things first, it's really important to understand, you know, if you do want to take up a, a cadetship, you know, what, what, what are companies looking for? So typically you would go to one of four maritime colleges. We work with two in particular. Um, the colleges are usually looking for, so if, you, if you're going to be looking to do a maybe a foundation degree, you'll be, they'll be looking for someone who is going to be 18 on the, maybe the 1st of September of that year. Um, the, we'll be looking for 64 UCAS points. Now, if you don't know how many UCAS points you've got, there's some great calculators if you just Google it and type in UCAS points and put in your courses um, and your grades or expected grades, that will let you know how many UCAS points you have. Um, so we specifically look for, for someone that has got uh, maths or science as part of their studies. Um, and at least five GCSEs. I've put here at grade B, but um, that would be a, um, a, a level five now, and that's maths in English and science as well. Um, and that's pretty much across the board. So that's that's not just BP that's looking for that. Those are the, the maritime colleges. Um, if you want to do a foundation degree, those are the standard requirements. Um, but really, you know, above kind of the technical side, it's much more about those soft skills that are really important so to be a, a cadet um, on especially especially on one of our tankers but you know equally uh, if you, you went to look at somewhere like Carnival and one of the the big cruise ships you still need to you know have that real can-do attitude adaptability and resilience because you're not always going to have great days some days they're going to be real challenges where you're going to have to dig deep so um, you need that drive and self-sufficiency as well and be very self-disciplined and have that aptitude for, for learning because you're going to be picking up lots of different skills. And I think first and foremost, it's going to be a great big adventure. So someone that's really adventurous would fit in well. But, you know, in, in return as a cadet, you can, you know, you can expect um, a, an internationally recognized uh, professional office with watch certificate at the end of it you you know there's a great lifestyle on board which I can talk through in a in a moment um, you know if you if you came and joined somewhere like BP ultimately you could be in charge of a ship worth hundreds of millions of pounds and get exposure to cutting edge technology um, it is some some of the the cadets have talked about you know the lifelong friends that they've made um, from their cadetship. The the time away from work is is really unmatched in any other career, and you know you've uh, you you've really got a dedicated supervisor that will support you through your performance and, and development as well. So whilst you've got that self drive, you've actually got somebody that you can uh, that you can turn to if you've got questions. Um, also. I mean, at BP, we give we give an, an annual allowance uh, of eleven thousand pounds. So in the first year, you get nine hundred. In the second year, nine fifty. In your third year, you get a thousand pounds. And and on top of that, you know, you get your your all your your education paid for as well. And you know, I think that that's pretty typical across um ac across the the different providers too. And. What would you get in return? So you would get a, a three-year foundation degree. So if you decide to to join as as a deck cadet, now we we take our deck cadets to uh, to Fleetwood uh, College, Nautical College, which is in Blackpool, and you would study a foundation degree in nautical science. Um, if you feel more technical and wanted to be an engine follow an engineering um cadetship or or a um, electrotechnical officer cadetship then you would actually go to um the south shields college um and now that is near newcastle upon time and you would study for a foundation in either marine engineering or electrical engineering. So this is a these are a really structured three year programs. So first year you'd live in halls of residence, probably years years two and three. Um, I expect you'd want to live. You know, you'd be much more comfortable and experienced. I expect you want to live in in a, in, a, in a house outside of halls. But there's three structured sorry five structured phases. You'd start off at college learning the basics and then you'd come and spend three or four months at sea um, learning, you know, le le learning with with other cadets and um, spending time with officers and, you know, depending on what you want to, what, which, which, um, 
uh, offering you want to go for, you know, you'd either be up on deck or, or in the engine room or, or the communications room. Um, you know, it's very practical hands-on experience that you would get at sea and, you know, be really expected to, to muck in and, you know, do your fair share of chipping and painting as well. Um, but then there'll be plenty of time at nautical college as well. So you would have your third phase back at college, your fourth phase back at sea. So you'd expect to have, you know, a good three or four months each time at sea, getting your uh, getting all your experience and your belt. And then you'd go back to take your final exams and you'd end up with um, a maritime and coast guard agency officer of the watch professional certificate. So that is your certificate of competence. So hopefully the, uh, the cadets will be able to, to bring this all to, to life a little bit more for you. Um, but life on board, uh, you know, it's not all work. There's a lot of downtime as well. So um, typically you would have a, a gym. There'd be an officer's lounge and bar. There'd be a TV room, uh, a library where you can get books and, and videos, uh, lots of various games to play. As you can see here, we have a, a, an Olympic sized swimming pool on board. Um, and I'm only joking, it's tiny, but it's, uh, it's great on the sunny days. And then there is a, a telephone and, and internet and access to internet and Wi-Fi as well. So there's plenty of opportunities to, to connect with home and your, your friends also. So this is the, the, the part really where I'd, um, I'd like the, the cadets to join in. So just keen to understand whether any of our cadets have managed to join yet. Yeah, hi, I'm here. Who's that, sorry? It's Elio. Hi, Elio. Hi, yeah. Do we have anyone else? Uh, yeah, I'm here also, it's Brad. Hi, Brad. Have we got Harry? Okay. Hi, Catherine, it's Sam. Hi, Sam. How are you doing? Have we got Jess and Elisa? Or Harry? Not yet. Okay, well, perhaps if we can start with um Elio, I think you were Elio, were you going to talk about the the the, the role of deck cadet or engineer cadet? Yeah, hi, I was going to talk about the role of an engine cadet. So do you want me to go ahead? Yeah, that would be fantastic. Oh uh, yeah, so the engineers are pretty much responsible for keeping the ship going. Um so if you think about the deck cadet officers as the eyes and ears of the ship, the engineers are sort of the brains and the muscle I'd say. Um, so all of the gear in the engine room is divided up uh, between the officers which e each officer being in charge for a different piece of the gear. Um, as a cadet you will normally assist an engineer with their job um, but as you get like more confident and gain more experience you can normally do the job under their supervision Normally this job will be the most interesting job, but occasionally it's the most messy. So be prepared for that. Um, it's really like unique, the things you do day to day. So one day you may be servicing a diesel generator or doing some maintenance on the main engine, fixing something. The next you'll be cleaning out the sewage treatment plant or fixing, I don't know, the chief mate's toilet. It really varies day to day. So it's like important to understand the ship is like a city at sea and it's your job to keep every part of that city going. Um, what's great about this is it gives you so much transferable skills. So on one hand, you'll be uh, conducting maintenance, getting your hands dirty on the tools, as well as uh, trend spotting, looking at like, how temperatures rise and the effects of that. Um, so yeah, it just means that you can use these skills in so many different other things, which I think is one of the best things about being an engineer, really. And yeah, that's about it. 
um, you just get all these really great skills. That's great. Thanks, Elio. And have we have we got Jess now who's joined to talk about debt? Yeah, sorry, I'm here now. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm a debt cadet and uh, as a debt cadet, you'll usually be um, you will have your time split whilst you're on board. Um, you'll probably do a navigational watch once a day with understudying an officer. So you'll be doing things like looking at the ship's position. You have to do 10 hours of steering the ship as well. Um, you'll be taking, looking at the weather um, and you, also every day you'll do some time on the deck with the deck crew. Um, whilst you're in port, you may assist with the mooring stations and with cargo operations. So you'll have a training record book to get signed off and essays to do whilst you're at sea. Um, so whilst the engineers think they run the show, uh, <laughs> you'll be the one steering the ship. So. That's fantastic, Jess. And what, what would you say has been the most, I guess, the most interesting, but also the most challenging time um, while you've been at sea? Oh, wow. That's a, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, I think every day is interesting and every day is a challenge. Uh, you learn something new every day from every single member of crew you work with. Um, I guess for me, my first uh, trip at sea was um, during the start of the coronavirus pandemic. So it was really kind of sad. We, we went to New York. Uh, so we were sat opposite New York and the captain said to me after I'd finished uh, a really long day of cargo work, oh, if it wasn't coronavirus, you could have had the whole day off to go and explore New York. So oh, no. I guess that was challenging, but hopefully next time it'll be better. That must have been so frustrating for you. But at least you get to see New York from a distance, hey? Yeah, I guess it's a viewpoint most people don't see, so. <laughs> That's great, Jess. Thanks ever so much for, for, for bringing that to life for me. And has Harry managed to join? Well, Harry's our... Um, our, our our ETO cadet um, and was going to was going to talk talk through that a little bit. Um, does it is it does anybody feel comfortable enough to talk about the the ETO Sorry, the role yes, of the ETO? Yeah, oh, you're here. Fantastic, yeah, Harry. I've never done this before. <laughs> no, no, no worries at all. You have the floor. Uh, well, yes, as Jess said, um, the engineers think they're on the ship and the deck officers think they're on the ship, but uh, harsh reality is. The electrician runs the ship. They say behind every good chief engineer, there's a good electrician. Um, sadly, that's true. Um, so my job on board is to look after all the electrical systems, whether they be the light bulbs going down from uh, radars, uh, anything electrical, really. So, um, yes, uh, I think the, the hardest thing I've had to do was uh, work on GMDSS, which is um, it's basically a distressed uh, system. Um and I had to change the antenna. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much sums up my job, really. Um, uh, yeah, so um, the cadet ship wise, uh, you have to do fault finding at college, um, as well as advanced maths, standard, really, um, and various other sort of subjects. The course rate is more tailored around to uh, to. A um, but yes, it's, um, it's certainly an interesting role, certainly the most technical, I hate to say, a very controversial thing to say, the most technical role out of uh, everyone on board ship. And I, I think that's my, my 50 pence worth, really. Well, it sounds like you all have a really important role to play in your, in your own area. Um, so thank you ever so much for, for bringing those to, to life for me. I think it's, you know, it's always difficult when you read something on a, uh, on, on a piece of paper, but when somebody talks through what you have to do and the, and the, the, the good things about it and the challenges uh, makes it, uh, you know, makes it much more interesting. So um, Brad and, and Sam, I think it'd be really good to hear a little bit from, from both of you around sort of life, life at sea and um, what you get to do in your, in your spare time. Okay, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll lead on that one. So I'm Sam, I'm a fourth engineer. I qualified, uh, finished my cadetship in 2017. 
Uh, so I've got a, a few years, a few years at sea now. And uh, really, when I want to talk about life at sea, I thought I'd first explain what motivated me to come away to sea. Um, I was doing a, an office job and um, where really the, the majority of what I was doing was paperwork and it really didn't suit my style of working. So really, um, motivations for me for coming away to sea, well, I wanted something other than a nine to five. I mean, it, a nine to five is quite nice. It, it's quite gentle for a start. But the monotony is a real killer when you have to go and do the same thing day in, day out, five days a week. You spend uh, half of Saturday recovering from your week and then, you know, you spend Sunday thinking about going back to work. Um, you're free of a commute. So uh, I was doing an hour and a half each way. Uh, and that just is time out of your life that's, that's wasted and you don't get back. Um, the benefit of coming away to sea and doing a cadetship is that you're paid to train. Even if you, you know uh, you go to a standard university, then uh, you're going to incur, uh, you know, student fees, and they're quite substantial, and you do have to pay them back. And also, really, I wanted to work with my hands. So um, when you when you look at the the options available to you, it, it might be something worth considering if you want to do something that's both mentally stimulating and something also. To do with your hands you know it's, uh, it's not a not a usual mix so really I, I want to talk about the positives that I've, I've felt from working at sea and I think the first point I want to cover is that uh, and this goes for whatever role you are um, at sea uh, there's a real spirit of teamwork um, the, a ship is a small place uh, and everybody does really need to get on and work together uh, there's a whole variety of personalities and problems you have to cope with. Uh, and But the one thing I would say about seafarers and working at sea is that generally people get on uh, and, that, and that's a, a real positive. Um, the thing that's always sold is that you get to see lots of bits of the world. And it is true in a sense, um, I've got to see a lot of interesting places, even if sometimes it's a short, short time there, uh, uh, you do get to see places that you might not see otherwise if you were you know, in a standard job. Uh, so, yeah, I've had some great times, uh, you know, been to Sydney during the Festival of Lights, been to some great nights out in Dubai and, you know, South Africa, Cape Town, India, all, all over the world. So that is interesting. And it's, it's certainly a point you can talk to your friends about. Um, and the, the most obvious one, I guess, is uh, leave periods. So, um, it opens up the possibility of doing things in your leave that you might not be able to do because of time constraints because of the weekend thing, like I was saying earlier, you know, spend half of Saturday recovering with a nine to five and then Sunday worrying about going to work. So you can have a, a big stretch of time in which you can do whatever you like, um, free, free of coronavirus. Um, you know, you, you could do some traveling in that time. You can have pet projects. Uh, so that's a real positive. Um, also, the, the, the ability to save money, uh, particularly while you're young and you don't have dependents and stuff like that, is while you're away, you, you typically don't spend a lot of money. So you, you can amass uh, money and really uh, move yourself on in terms of you know, sorting yourself out a house and all the boring bits. Um, the, the negatives, uh, the, the realities of it is that the worst bit is being away from home. So it is tough. Um, it doesn't exactly get easier. It's a long period away uh, and it, it is quite taxing. Um, you do start to get used to it a bit more, but it, it, it can, it's something to consider um, that it's, you, you're away for things like uh, birthdays and potentially Christmases. Um, you're away for things like uh, deaths in the family and, and all, all of those sort of things can, can be quite taxing on an individual and something that you need to consider. Uh, but again, lots of people get through it uh, and, and there are ways of dealing with it, uh, but it's just the, what, the nature of the job. Um, as, it, as, uh, as mentioned by Catherine, we do have access to the internet and that's excellent. So you can, uh, you can talk to your, your partners and your family and that makes a difference. It is limited. You, you're not gonna be watching YouTube uh, but uh, WhatsApp, um, so sharing photos and messaging, that's, that's fine. 
specifically referring to work in the engine room. Um, the first thing I'll say about that work is it can be hot in the engine room. It's something that you might not consider, but I, it's not unusual to have a, a 30 degree uh, working atmosphere. Uh, and that is something you do adjust to, but for a start, it's quite a shock. Um, the work isn't all, uh, you know, glamorous overhauls and exciting work. Um, as was mentioned by Elio, uh, even whatever rank you are, there's an element of doing pretty mundane stuff. But equally, that goes in hand in hand with doing exciting work that you might have not done before. Um, and that really keeps you on your toes. Uh, and part of part of your job is, is um, routine watch keeping and looking after machinery, but it's also uh, watch keeping in the evening periods. And you, you, always you know when you go to bed uh, when you're on duty there's always an element of excitement because you're not quite sure what's going to happen in the night what you're going to have to deal with and if you uh if you're switched on person that keeps you uh keeps you mentally stimulated which i think is an important part of the job um yeah touching back on your working patterns quite often your work will be working normal periods in the day so that could start at 7 30 in the morning you work through to five and then depending on how many people are on a ship, uh, an engineer, a qualified engineer will have a duty evening where you look after watch keeping overnight till the next day. Uh, but occasionally when there's uh, big work on, the days can be really long um, and everyone has to dig in and they do. It is, it is part of the fun, can be tough. And so, yeah, I mean, that sort of sums up the, the negatives that I wanted to share with you guys. But uh, I just thought I'd also cover off what I think uh, I would like to impart on anybody that's considering a career at sea and, and, and makes it through to being a cadet and being on board for the first time. And it's just that it's a, it's a strange and alien world for a start, but the more you dig in, the easier it gets. Um, and, and, and that's it. And it's just the, the most important attribute is that you're gonna just uh, tough it out and, and, and believe that things get easier and you, you, know, you get used to the, the feelings of being away in a ship. and, and it, yeah, that's that's very satisfying. So that's uh, that sums me up there. Thank you, Catherine. Well, I think that has really brought it to life there, Sam. Thank you. Uh, you touched on having extended leave where you can take travel. Sort of typically, how long will you have off in between time at sea? So of a, a normal contract, which is about three and a half months, you might get something like a two and a half to three months leave. Brilliant. Thank you. That's, um, that's fantastic. It's really helpful to understand. Um, so perhaps now if we can move to, to Danny. Danny, have you managed to join? Yes, I'm here, Catherine. Yeah. Oh, super. So perhaps you could, you could walk us through your career a little bit and what brought you into, uh, in, into a maritime career. Yeah, sure. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Danny Middle. Um, I'm currently a vessel manager with our LNG vessels. So um, I'm currently looking after three of the LNG vessels and two on a permanent basis and covering one at the moment for somebody else. Um, so obviously they're moving um, liquefied natural gas around the world at the moment, one of which is um, currently in Texas, Freeport in Texas. Uh, another one's battering its way through a, a storm in the Atlantic at the middle of, middle of the Atlantic at the moment. So they're, they're chundering through some, some quite heavy weather. Um, but yeah, I I am basically an example of um, of what happens when you when you let a cadet ship run its full course, I suppose, or or run amok. <laughs> it's um, I started as an engineer cadet in 1991 um, at South Shields College in Tyneside, um, completing my uh, cadet ship in 1994. That then was a slightly different format in that you kind of did a year at college, a year at sea, and then a year back at college again. Um, so yeah, qualified in 1994. Um, thankfully, was 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 offered a job and took the job with BP um, and came out as a junior engineer in the summer of '94. Um, that that rank doesn't actually exist anymore. Um, we've we've kind of done away with that one, so everybody starts as a as a fourth engineer now. Um, and then I essentially just worked my way up through the ranks. So spent time as junior, fourth, third second and then um, got promoted to chief engineer in 2008. Um, at that point um, that was on, a, on an oil vessel and then I spent 10 years sailing as a, a chief engineer 
um, in the fleet on both oil and LNG vessels, um, pretty much a 50-50 split actually. Um, in 2018, I came into the office on a secondment. So sometimes they, um, they dip into our sea staff personnel um, uh, to ask them to come ashore and help out with little bits and pieces that, that, that need doing ashore. Um, I was asked to come in and do that in the beginning of 2018 and, um, and I've not gone back to sea. So I, I got uh, offered a, a permanent role as a vessel manager in 2019, uh, took that and I've, I've been there since. So um, as I say, currently I manage two vessels. Um, that for me means I provide sort of technical um, moral support uh, for everybody on board. I'm kind of the, the, the link pin really between the vessel and the shore. Um, and so I also need to obviously provide sort of that, that technical level of support as well to the vessels. And having spent 10 years as a chief and worked my way through, um, you know, there's quite a bit of experience there to, to call upon if required. Um, so yeah, for me now, it's, it's a shore-based role, um, but I do get to go back to see the ships from time to time, although uh, again, COVID-19 has, has put the dampness on that at the moment, as it has for many things, I know. Um, but yeah, so normally I'm based in Sumbri or Canary Wharf. I, I tend to do a, a, a day or two in Canary Wharf a week and then the rest of the time in Sumbri. But um, like most people in the, in the company at the moment, I've been working from home since, um, since March of last year. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's been quite an extensive career for me. Um, and, and one, I've got to say, I've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed. Every day is a learning day. Um, one, of the, one of the best things I, I felt during my career when I was at sea is, is particularly when I started getting up towards the, um, the more senior ranks on board was, was the fact that y you basically had to do what you needed to do with the resources you've got available to you, whether that's manpower, whether that's spare gear, um, whether that's you know, just cargo, you've, you've got what you've got on board, um, essentially to, to fix the problems you find. So um, that I always find a challenge um, and, uh, and very, very satisfying when you, when you got through it with a successful outcome. They weren't always successful, but uh, in the majority of cases, they, they, they tended to be. But um, yeah, that, that was one of the, um, the, the bits I enjoyed most of my time at sea, I've got to be honest, because it's, it's as I say, you, you've got a limited amount of resources to work with and you've got to be able to find a fix. So, uh, that, was, that was very enjoyable. And, and I think um, for me as well, I, I think it'll probably be a, a common theme with everybody. Uh, the, the downside was always going to be the time spent away. Um, I mean, when I started, uh, the trip lengths used to be quite a bit longer. Um, we used to do sort of up to six months away and the leave was shorter as well. Thankfully, that's, uh, that's got better and the, the leave ratios have got better too. Um, but it, it's, 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 always, um, it's always difficult, that, that travel to the airport. Uh, I den tended to find when I got into um, the departures lounge at the airport, that was pretty much my cutoff point. So it, it kind of went from being at home to being at work when I went through the security into the um, into the departures lounge so um, yeah that that never really got any easier um, particularly having you know a family as well it's 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 not a pleasant experience but it, it, it's part and parcel of the job and, and when you roll it all together for me that balance was was weighed heavily in the favor of, um, of the amount of time I got at home uh, as leave, as quality time. So it's always um, it's always a balance, and it's all all about life choices, isn't it? But yeah, that's essentially me, guys. Thanks for that, Danny. And perhaps if you could uh, if you could talk us through a little bit about the sort of the, the team on board and who um, you know who the cadets might have to kind of work with and, and learn to yeah. communicate with on a daily basis. Yeah, certainly. So um, what you see on the screen there is essentially um, the, the, the manning structure for a, a, a merchant vessel at sea. Now, the, there's more numbers here and there. Um, we, we have more than one AB, we have more than one OS, um, and we may have extra officer ranks as well. But essentially, um, <clears throat> you'll see there, it's kind of split into to two halves almost, if you like. So you've got the uh, the deck side and the engineering side. Um, 
there's a, a kind of subdivision to that, which, which is Harry is part of, um, which is around the electrical system. So although they report into the chief and second engineer, um, the, the kind of um, the, the, the sort of self-autonomous uh, in that work, as is the gas engineer, which is obviously a rank specific to, um, to gas carrying ships. But um, yeah, so as you can see, the, the, the highlighted um, boxes are, are where the cadets kind of fit into the organization as things are. Um, so as a cadet, obviously there's, um, there's no direct responsibilities for a cadet on board. Um, obviously you need to be able to um, do your work safety safely and you need to be aware of all the um, the safety rules and regulations precautions what you need to do in event of a fire alarm and a, a boat muster and things like this so um, there's, there's certain expectations but a lot of them are removed until you sort of qualify um, and then yeah so with the deck cadets primarily um, the work will either be on the bridge um, doing watches so you'll you'll shadow one of the officers up on the bridge, um, do eight hours a day up there, in in two four hour watches, and then um, bits and pieces of uh, day work as well, um, which is usually where the chief officer comes in. The chief officer usually sort of manages the day work, uh, manages the crew, and they'll go out and work on deck, chipping, painting, um, you know, repairs and um, maintenance on on deck equipment the likes of that. Um, also, obviously, the, the cargo side of things as well. The chief officer is very heavily involved in that. So as a deck cadet, generally, your, your time will be split sort of 50-50 between doing time as a watchkeeper and doing time on, on day work with the, with the chief officer and the, and the, the day work bunch. Um, obviously, overall, we have the master. Uh, now, the master is from the deck side so he's your your captain um so he's uh he's come up through the um the deck side and he has overall responsibility for the vessel so that's it kind of um although he's part of the, the the deck department if you like obviously he's got a kind of um standalone role and as i say does take accountability for a lot of um things with the vessel in terms of the overall um, accountabilities for the ship, for example, you know, if it, if it were to run aground or, or um, involved in a collision or something, the first person they, they go looking for is generally the ship's master. So um, on the engineering side, um, this, is, this is where I came through from. So again, you start down the bottom with an engine cadet. Now, again, um, there's essentially two different ways of working. So primarily these days, it'll be day work. Um, so we, we, we run a system called Unmanned Machinery Space. Um, and what happens is essentially everybody goes down during the course of the day, works a, a sort of full working day down there. And then one of the qualified engineers will then be the duty engineer for the night. So they'll inspect the engine room. Um, and then once everybody's finished, the alarms will be routed to their cabin and around the accommodation. Uh, area so that if there is an alarm they're alerted and they go down and deal with it so that's generally the way things work these days but sometimes you'll still be asked to go on watches um, which are which are same to the watches that, that, that go on a, on the bridge so they might be four hour watches usually or sometimes you'll do eight hour watches but it'll be again uh, an eight hour period in the day with with a little bit either side for for, for some bits and pieces but uh, as I say, that's that's rarer these days in the, in the engine room. The majority is done under the unmanned machinery space. But um, again, they would be working, um, as Elio alluded to earlier, um, you, you know, you'll be sort of job shadowing um, virtually any of the engineers, actually. I mean, it, it just kind of depends on what's being done, um, where the focus is, where you need to be on your task records. Um, and And you know, focusing and, and varying your training um, to suit. So there's no sort of fixed, fast, you will do this, you will do that. There's there's a lot of variability in it. But the second engineer is, is generally the boss in the engine room. 
um, he does the day-to-day -day management down there. And again, overseen by the chief engineer, which is um, generally quite a, a managerial role. He oversees things, organizes maintenance, deals with, um, well, deals with me and, and things like that from ashore along with the master. Um, and then, like I say, um, a slight offshoot to that would be around the electrical systems. Um, so our ESEs and also gas engineers. Now, gas engineers are generally um, normal engineers, if you like, which then decide they want to, to move over to focus on cargo work. So um, they're generally people who've got up to the rank of third engineer, sometimes second engineer, but usually third engineer. And then they do some additional training which will allow them to operate and maintain a lot of the cargo equipment which is which is on board an LNG ship. And then as I say with the electrical side, um, Harry's taught very well to to the requirements and, 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 and what those guys do but basically anything with a current in it that's uh, that's in their remit. So be it lights, be it radars, be it instrumentation, be it generators, it, it's uh, again a very very wide spectrum. And that pretty much it really. The other ranks we can see on there are our ratings. So um, pump and bosun, ABs, OSs, they're the, the, the deck ratings. Um, fitter, motormen, uh, our engine room ratings. And then obviously you've got the catering department as well, which is the, the cook, the second cook and the messman. So um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it guys. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for bringing all of that to, to life, Danny. That's incredibly helpful. Um, I don't see, I'm conscious of time. We've uh, we've only got a, a one minute before we're meant to move through to questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to really quickly talk you through what a typical application and assessment process might look like. So, um, and having been through other uh, other presentations with other companies earlier today, I can say that this is fairly standard. So it will be a, an application that you would usually fill in um, alongside a CV, sending your CV. These days, everything would be submitted electronically. Um, if you pass the first round of, of shortlist, um, you would usually be asked to complete a short video. Um, now, we use, a, we use a company called HireView, a piece of software, um, and it's a video, a short recording that you would do in your own time. The one that we do is, is just asks you three questions that you answer in about five minutes. And then uh, we have a few multiple choice questions, which uh, we call a realistic job questions um, and makes you really think about whether this might be the right career for you as you go through and answer those. Then on top of that, there are some psychometric tests. Now, I know those sound quite scary, but actually it is just um, sort of numerical and verbal so so you read a paragraph and answer some multiple choice questions and the same from a maths perspective um, they take about 20 minutes to do and again everyone everyone has to go through them um, and if you are lucky enough to be shortlisted for the the assessment center um, traditionally assessment centers are usually face to face but thanks to the uh, the global pandemic everything has moved online now um, and we We'll ask a, we'll do a, a, one to, a one to maybe one to two interview where you'll be asked some behavioural based questions. So these are competency questions. And then on top of that, you'll be asked some more role based questions, which are also um, known as technical questions as well. And then there would be a, a group exercise where you would um, work something through with the, the rest of the, the people at the assessment center. Um, usually there's no right or wrong answer to it, it's just a, an observation as to how you work together. So a few hints and tips for you. Uh, from a, a CV perspective, um, you know, it, it's typical that you would make it, you would have a one to two page CV um, and that would include um, your career goals which you would put in a, a personal summary at the top. Uh, you would include uh, then your education. Um, we would want you to include your um, sort of your institution, the course name and, and your results um, or expected results if you haven't sat them yet. Uh, any extracurricular activities, any work experience, you know, be that full-time, part-time volunteering internships that you've done. Um, and then any other extracurricular activities like Duke of Edinburgh or any uh, RYA qualifications or other cadetships such as Sea Cadet or Army Cadet. Then with regards to the, the higher view, um, it is only a five minute video 
I think the best thing to do is find a quiet space, use the practice sessions as much as possible so you feel comfortable. You will normally see your own face um, that you'll be looking at in the video screen. So don't be unnerved by that. Um, and just remember that everyone is out, everyone else is going through that same process as well. So don't give up. It's only a short video and it gives a real insight into your passion and drive for a career at sea. Then you've got the, the online psychometric tests that I mentioned. So we uh, we have um, sort of numerical verbal reasoning, um, error checking, any diagrammatic, spatial and, and mechanical reasoning as well. And you would normally sort of read a, read a paragraph or read a diagram or, or read a, a maths question and then it would be multiple choice questions. And I say they, they only take 20 minutes and there's lots of companies, um, including SHL, which is the company we use, that will allow you to do practice tests and get yourself ready to uh, complete them. So again, when you're doing those psychometric tests, do practice as much as can. Keep your eye on the time. If you don't know the answer, the best thing to do is just to move on because then you're giving yourself the best opportunity to get through all the questions in the time that you have and just stay calm and have the confidence that you can do it. So finally, if you make it to the assessment centre, the first part is usually a, um, an, an interview where you'll be asked some competency questions. Now, these are typically um, give me a time or ask, tell me, tell me about a time when you've done this, that or the other. They will usually be related to um, a company's um, behaviours, values and behaviours. Now, at BP, they are safety, respect, excellence, courage and one team. And as you can imagine, all of those competencies are something that we would look for in a cadet um, but you should always check the the company's career site because they will tell you what the uh, the competencies are that or the values and behaviors are that um, that company is looking for and what I would recommend is that you have a look at those think about the qualities that are the strongest in you and think of some examples where you've demonstrated those qualities and any experiences that you're particularly proud of and, and also any experiences that you've been really that have been real challenging but but you've actually worked through and then using the framework stars which is set the scene so explain what the situation was the task that you were dealing with the action you personally took so how you went about it and what the result was and what you learned from it so do some self-reflection at the end you're not going to be able to predict every question but if you think through some different examples ahead it will put you in a real good stead to be able to answer lots of the questions so typically you would have a competency interview, technical questions and the group session. Um, all I can recommend is that set yourself up um, with your technology ahead of ahead of time, a good sort of 10, 15 minutes. Make sure it's all working, that you've got the sound working. Um, don't worry if the technology fails you. Contact the recruiter and they will sort you out. And, and again, the most important thing is make sure you're not going to be disturbed during those times because you don't want to get derailed by someone popping into the room. If you do need any additional support or, or adjustments, then just let the recruiter know and they'll make sure that they can support you. So that's everything um, that I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so much for, for listening. Hopefully, um, Gregory, there's a whole host of questions that the cadets will want to, to ask our cadets. Is there is there anything that um, anything that that, that's up there that you would like to uh, to share with us to ask us uh yeah so um i'll uh take over the q a um so our first question was um are there places for doctors and medics on your ships danny do you want to take that one yeah certainly um what we have because we don't have um a large number of people on our vessels. We, we are not legally required to carry a doctor. Um, but what we do have is we have everybody trained in first aid and we also have um, the generally the chief officer and the master will also have undergone what they call the, the ship's captain's medical course, which is um, a, a much more in-depth um, first aid course, if you like. So the simple answer is no, we don't carry um, doctors, everybody is trained rudimentary 
as a as a medic and and some are trained to a a higher level to deal with um um relatively simple medical um complaints that you might find at sea but then we also have a backup of um of, of calling people ashore who provide medical assistance to uh, well, I hope that answered your question. Um, what are the vision requirements to join? Are they the same as the Navy? That is a very good question. Um, I um, So I, I don't know what the vision requirements are. I know that you have to pass a medical, so it will be whatever is stipulated in the in the standard medical. I, I can find out and um, and get that information back to you. Okay, cool. Yeah, and, and it varies as well what, what you're actually doing on board. For example, the um, the eyesight um, requirements are more stringent for a, for a deck officer than they are for an engineer, but engineers, uh, it's essential, and particularly ESEs, it's essential that you're not colorblind um, because they don't want you getting hold of the wrong colored wire. So, yeah, so, so it does vary as well. It's not just one, one rule for everybody. Cool. Um, okay, well, this one is uh, for everyone, I guess, so we could sort of take it in turns to answer. Um, where have... Um, it's where have you visited in the world, but um, probably it'd be quicker to where have you not. So if people would want to say where your favourite place was that work brought you. Uh, should we start with Catherine? Well, I, I, I have never been on a ship. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. My favourite place um, has was uh, was skiing a couple of years ago in Le Minuire in the Alps. But um, you're probably never going to go there as a, a cadet specifically. Uh, wondered whether Brad or Elisa might like to speak because I know you haven't had a, a chance to speak yet. Uh, I'll go first. Hi, I'm Elisa. I'm a third officer. Um, on the deck side. Um, probably one of my favourite places that I've been is New Zealand um, and probably Tasmania. Um, we used to do sort of multi-port discharges in New Zealand so we'd go into lots of different places and you'd go quite close to sort of towns and in quite close to the cities which was quite nice. It was very easy to get ashore, you could walk out of a gate and you were in the town which was really really nice because sometimes you're quite far off um, you're quite far off and it's quite hard to get into places. So as a watchkeeper, it's very nice to be able to get straight straight into the town and get ashore. So probably Australia and New Zealand for me. Cool. What about you, Brad? Uh, yeah, I, I've only done two trips. So my first one, I basically was all around Australia. So I've been uh, Sydney, Cairns, um, but then halfway through the trip, we went towards Singapore, then Hong Kong. So I managed to get a shore in Hong Kong. So I'd probably say Hong Kong was my favorite. Um, but my second trip, I got ashore once um, and that was going home. So, um, yeah, so um, you have to be prepared that you're not always going to get ashore. But it is nice just to sit on the deck, just look out hot sun and just see the views but sometimes you're always like but I suppose that's what the leaves for uh in your leave you could you have all the time in the world to go wherever you want so but yeah it's the perks of it but as I said I've only been on two trips so yeah thanks Brad okay cool so um this is another one sort of for the cadets um is anyone on a ship now um and if so, where are they? Is anyone on a ship now? We 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 chose not to um, not to include anyone that's been on on the ship just in case there were poor comms. But um, there is uh, someone called Chris Thompson who is currently on ship, and um, and I know that when last time I spoke to him, he was just going through the Panama Canal. Ooh. Okay. Um... So how much do you earn when you start and um, how much is the sort of potential to earn as you rise through the ranks? So 
when you when you start as a cadet, um, you would receive an allowance. So so we sponsor a cadets. So cadets aren't employed by us, um, but you would get an annual allowance of around eleven thousand pounds. So that would be you get nine hundred and fifty a month in your first year. Uh, sorry, nine hundred in your first year, nine fifty in your second year, and a thousand in your third year, and then. Uh, as a when you qualify, I believe you'd be expected to be earning around thirty five thousand. Okay, got a few more questions left. Um, and I guess it's important to add that um, that would be tax free as well, because uh, with BP you'd be working through uh, through Singapore, um, which makes a big difference. Okay, do we have any more questions from Oh, um, how long do you get on shore while the uh, ship is being stopped up? Shall I take that one? Um, I mean, it, it varies, um, but generally it doesn't vary a lot. Um, you, you can basically work on the basis of um, a, a load or a discharge operation on the, the LNG fleet, for example, which is um, where our, our, our British officers now, now work. Um, it's, it's pretty much 24, 26 hours um, to get one of those either loaded or discharged. Um, obviously there's other factors around when you can get ashore and even if you're allowed ashore, sometimes um, the, the port restrictions prevent you from from even getting ashore but um that's relatively rare but yeah so you'd normally try and find a bit of space in a, in a approximately a 24-hour period lovely okay um yeah so do you have any dedicated firefighters on board again i can come in on that one um this is another thing where Essentially, everybody is trained up to a, a, a basic level. Everybody has to pass um, firefighting training uh, along with their first aid training and alongside um, survival at sea training too. So there's requirements on everybody to have undertaken that. Now, again, you know, you're not a full firefighter, but you are trained to a level whereby you can, you can deal with stuff in a in an emergency uh form fire teams there's equipment on board you know the full fire suits the helmets the all the hoses all that sort of stuff is available breathing apparatus so um the answer is no we don't carry dedicated fire teams but what we do is we train our people to be able to cover that role oh um okay this is a very good question actually is there a return of service expected after training So do you, do you mean once once you've completed your cadetship, would there be opportunities with BP? Yes. Uh, well, um, I think, is it sort of, I think that asking, is it um, mandatory? Yeah, is it a tie-in effect, like a clawback type thing, Catherine, I think? Um, not not as far as, as I'm aware. So... Um, you know, once you've you know once you've completed your your qualification, you're you're a qualified um, officer, and it would be I guess it would be up to you to to find your employment. Um, you know, with with BP, it would very much depend on what opportunities were on the on the fleet at the time. So we wouldn't be able to guarantee you work. Um, but, you know, I learned today a fact that 90% um, of the goods that come in or out of the UK are actually transported by the Merchant Navy. So even if it isn't with BP, um, there is a lot of there is a lot going on. So there is a lot of likelihood that there will be many opportunities available for a qualified officer. Yeah, we, de we definitely saw the same webinar, Catherine. <laughs> I remember that fact. <laughs> um, I stole that from Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, 
We've got one, someone who's quite fashion conscious. Uh, what is the uniform like? It's, uh, it's quite spick and span. Um, uh, for us, I mean, obviously it depends on um, which company you work for slightly as well. Um, but for us, uh, essentially, it, it is the, um, very, very similar to the, the Royal Naval uh, officer's uniform in many ways. Um, we, we all have epaulets once you qualify. Well, cadets do too, but everybody has epaulets that they're expected to wear for, for evening meal uh, in uniform. Um, those look very, very similar to, to, to the Royal Naval ones. So, for example, when I was a chief engineer, I had four bands with the, with the hoop on the top, um, much like a, a captain would do in the, in the Royal Navy. The only difference being that the banding is slightly thinner. Um, but other companies have diamonds rather than the hoop. So it, 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 it varies a little, but um, the, the mandatory uniform that we ask for is essentially um, trousers, jumper, shirt, epaulettes, um, shoes but if, if you want to and most people do for their weddings and things like that you can you can get fully decked out in um, in, in all the bells and whistles with the reefer jacket and everything uh, and the steaming bonnet so yeah it, it but it is it's very very similar looking to uh, to a uh, royal naval officers uh, regalia okay um what is a standard watch pattern on board Um, I can take that for the deck side. Uh, so for the deck side, you work uh, four, four hours on, eight hours off. So for me, my last trip, I worked the eight till 12. So I'd work eight till 12 in the morning. Then I'd maybe do a couple of hours of overtime uh, after lunch at one o'clock. And then I'd be back on watch again, eight o'clock at night, up until midnight. Um, for the, I think the engineers, uh, they're generally, they generally do day work unless they have to do uh, the watch keeping pattern as, as well for any reason. Uh, so uh, they do the same, they'd fall into the same watch, watch pattern that the deckies do. Um, the engineers, as Sam was saying before, they generally do the day work and then they take it in turns on a rotor uh, to hold the, uh, like the watch period overnight when they go uh, unmanned, where the alarm panel is in all around the ship. So if there's an alarm goes off, uh, that duty engineer knows he needs to go down, go down to the engine room and, and sort it out. Very much. Um, can you be based from the UK? Um, so do you have many sort of shore based opportunities um, for sort of starting out? Um, starting out, you, you will follow the, the sort of standard cadetship routine so um, what Catherine talked to um, during the presentation so there'll be time at college in the UK time at sea time at college time at sea um, and uh, that's that's quite fixed um, the the beauty of the job um, if you like once you're qualified is that really you can you can live anywhere you choose to um, because the, there isn't really a specific point of work um ashore in the uk so you can you really you can you can live anywhere you choose um because really all you're going to be doing is traveling to the airport and flying out to join a ship wherever it might be or if it happens to be in the uk you might get a hire car or catch a train down to, to to wherever that might be um for me i've got i've kind of moved through and come out the other end if you like so um for me i've got a shore based role now um and that's based in the southeast but um that's not you know, that's not the conventional um, seagoing role. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, uh, this is a great question from Mariad. Uh, what is the future expectation for unmanned vessels and how might this impact on these opportunities? Wow. That is a question and a half. <laughs> yeah, that is a good one. <laughs> Danny, can you stab, have a stab at that? <laughs> yeah, I can. I, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I could go on for ages. But yeah, I mean, th th they're always, um, all employers uh, are always looking for ways to streamline their operation. Um, Manning is, is a substantial portion of the cost for, um, for, for a marine company. So yeah. Um, they're, they're often looking for that. But 
what I would say in, in terms of unmanned um, for an ocean going ship, I, I think that's still a very, very long way off. I know, I know there's, there's some that do it in, in coastal waters on very short trade. Um, but I would also say that there still needs to be some levels of supervision um, and maintenance from the engineering side, from the, from the deck side as well. You know, they still, still need to be observed and kept an eye on in case they go rogue. But it's, um, yes, it's, it's, it's something that's been talked about for, for my entire career, actually. I think the Japanese had a couple of unmanned ships up in the inland sea when I first started out and everybody was humming and ahhing about whether that would be the end for seafarers. But um, I, I, I genuinely don't think that that's um, a realistic proposition, certainly in, in, in my lifetime. Cool, okay, uh, we've got a couple of medical questions. Um, so one is, um, if you've got a skin condition, um, would it affect your joining? Um, and the other is, if you have asthma, would it affect your um, cadetship program? I think they are probably both questions that would need to be answered when the when when the medical is being taken by yeah. by the doctor. That's not any; those are not questions that we could answer. I'm afraid. Um, just quickly, though, uh, for people who are considering it and may have slight medical issues, um, it is a lot. Um, the requirements aren't as strict as the Royal Navy, um, so you can Google ENG ones, and then that's the medical test we have to undertake. And there's so many information, so much information there. You can just scroll through the document, look for the ailment you might have, uh, and it'll say exactly what the requirements are, especially for eyes as well. Um, and everything else it's easy to google and yeah the merchant navy is very different to the royal navy in terms of those requirements jess that's really helpful thank you did you say that was eng1 yeah yeah brilliant hi, hi catherine also on this um i don't think we've mentioned that the merchant navy is is different to the navy in the sense it it encompasses lots of different things as well and lots of styles of work so yeah, different companies will have different requirements, but the ENG one is the, you know, the overall one that is mandatory for all seafarers. But I just thought I would, there's been a few questions about different styles of working. You know, a lot of people are qualified with have ended up on super yachts or going to cruise ships. Uh, and there, there's different lifestyle in each one. You know, when you undergo a cadetship with say an oil company or you, you're not just signing up to work for an oil company. You know, there's, there is lots of opportunity in different areas. That's a very valid point, Sam. Thank you. Okay. Um, this one's probably better for the cadets. Um, have you been in any storms and what was it like? Uh, yeah, I can take one. So my last ship was the British Achiever, which is a, one of the new gas ships. And we had some rough weather, but the ship is so big that it pretty much just went straight through. But then again, I've been on product tankers. I was on the British Seafarer last year, and that would roll quite heavily. But as you say now, most of the British officers are on the gas ships. So it has been quite steady. Like I didn't really feel seasick on this trip, but I have felt it before. So it just depends on... I don't know, the sort of conditions and the ship you are on. Some ships are stable, whereas some are inherently like rolling. They do roll. So, Elio, how do you deal with seasickness? Oh, well, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> Sometimes it's just get on with the work, bear it. Um, but the first time I experienced it, like you honestly feel like you can't do anything. Mm. You feel so tired. And I'd say the worst part of it isn't actually doing work. It's going to sleep. It's horrible. I, I just struggled so much to get to sleep. Um, but it's sort of something you can deal with. And there's always nice weather if you wait a few days. So that's when you sort of catch up on your sleep. So Do you get um, used to it? Yeah, it's just sort of getting used to it, I'd say. I've never had to take seasickness tablets and I've never been like seasick before. Like I've been on boats like when I was younger, just like small pleasure craft. And I've never felt seasick, but on the ship where it's rolling, 
oh, it's, it's really bad. Well, it can be. But on these new gas boats, they're so big and really stable that you don't really feel anything. Thanks, Elio. That's really helpful to know. I should just mention as well, I've, I've served with guys who've been at sea 35 years and still suffer with seasickness. So it's, it's, if, you, if you suffer from it, it, it can be quite, um, quite annoying because it, sometimes it's not easy to shift, but most, most people seem to um, adapt to it pretty well. Thanks, Danny. Um, um, okay. Um, sort of. Uh, so we we spoke briefly. We asked a question about um, doctors and um, on your ships, um, and you said about that on bigger ones it is a requirement. So what sort of uh, companies do need doctors? Um, do cruise liners take them? Yeah, uh, in, a, in, a, in a word, yes. It's, um, it, it's, it, it's ships that carry more people. I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head what the exact number is, but you, you can carry up to a certain number of passengers. I think it's 12 and a, and a certain total number of people. Um, without the need to carry a doctor, but anything above that requires a doctor. Um, but yeah, cruise ships, uh, I mean, some of these are huge with 6,000 people on them, you know, um, again, pre-COVID perhaps, but it's, um, it's, it's that they've got some, some massive medical teams on board those vessels. Yeah, for sure. Thank you very much. Um, so we mentioned briefly about swimming pools um, earlier in the presentation. Uh, what is there for fitness regimes and are there, is there anything else for sort of downtime? Who wants to take that one? I can't really talk about fitness, but for downtime, the bar I thought was the best thing about a BP ship. Um, a lot of other sh uh, shipping companies have sort of stopped alcohol. Whereas in BP, we are allowed a certain number of units of beer or wine. And, you know, it sort of means that everybody sort of gathers together, especially engineers. We, we do a thing called sundowners. So after a day of work, we'll go up and to the bridge because you've got to think in the engine room, we're downstairs, don't really get much sun. We'll go down and maybe have like one or two beers as the sun sets which is like my, one of my favourite things to do in my downtime. And then go to the bar. We had like poker nights my last ship. I'd sort of do a quiz. Like as a cadet, you're sort of like the entertainment officer, I'd say. <laughs> so you sort of try and get everybody into the bar. You know, like just make things a bit more enjoyable. Um, but yeah, that's what I do. Like after I finish work, maybe chuck on a film. So it, it just depends. I couldn't really say on fitness because I didn't really go to the gym, but there is a gym and a ping pong table. <laughs> oh, there is a foosball table in the bar as well. And if that counts as fitness, but that's good fun. We had a few foosball tournaments. How do the other trainees keep fit while at sea? I'm not too sure. Uh, there, there, were, there is a gym. So I suppose they'd go to the gym. I, I don't know if somebody else is better to answer that because I didn't really go to the gym. Yeah, I mean, exercise isn't mandated. Um, the, the the job itself is, is there's quite a lot of cardiovascular goes on in the job itself, to be honest. Um, so we don't sort of mandate um, physical exercise sessions, but we tend to find that a lot of people will use the gym. Um, we do provide stuff for um you know sort of guidance for uh, routines and things like that should you should you wish to use them um but yeah it, it's it's not mandated but um it tends to be a very popular pursuit would jess and elisa sam and harry get involved or brad what would you do um, um so i i did try oh sorry sorry brad um i did i did try to go to the gym sometimes but um quite often you all day and you, all you want to do is sleep uh, but when I did go we had um, we had a row machine on board we had a treadmill we had like a little weights thing that I don't know what it's called um, but that it was always good to just go and just spend like half an hour on the row machine and stuff the only obviously 
in heavy weather, you can't use any of the equipment. Um, I, I was on the rowing machine once and then some heavy, heavy weather came in and just a rogue wave and suddenly the rowing machine is just tipping about. So it's just one of those. Um, but yeah, definitely a lot of the guys went to the gym religiously every day and um, some of them found it was a really good facility and especially the weights and stuff, they really enjoyed it. Uh, the trip is what you make it. Um, depends on what you do. I, I've always got a Nintendo Switch I take away to see with me and uh, have a have like a tournament to Mario Kart. It always keeps morale up. But the trip is what you make it. Um, always go out for sundowners, so I'm not mad to keep fit. But um, you just got to do what you can to, to help your shipmates out and keep yourself sane, really. I mean, just got to do your best. That's pretty much it. And uh, yeah, we, we have access to a swimming pool. Uh, it's normally, it's a small swimming pool and it's normally filled with seawater. Of course, it is uh, both weather dependent uh, as well, but it can be quite nice after a hot day in the engine room to go for a swim. I've seen people um, sort of after working hours, people will go, they'll go for a run around the deck, um, which some people like to go outside and do their exercise. Um, they've done sort of like um, sprinting laps on the Monkey Island. Uh, they've taken some of the equipment outside and some sort of like uh, some things outside with it. So you can you can kind of there's always places to exercise and there's equipment that's maneuverable that you can take out. Some people take stuff with them. Uh, so there's you know there are there are definitely ways to keep fit. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, it's probably quite a good question for. Uh, Dan, um, do you see BP investing in alternative means of propulsion? Oh, that's a juicy one. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, big, um, big topic that one, and and very very current. So yeah, really good question that one. Um, the, the, again, to to try and put it relatively simply, um, yes, uh, we we need to make substantial emissions cuts by 2050. We've, um, you know, we as a group and the industry in general have committed to some substantial emissions cuts um, by, by 2050. I mean, um, again, this is specific to BP, but they've, you know, their, their ambition is net zero by 2050. So shipping does by its very nature um, emit CO2. It, it, it's a it's very very efficient way of, of um, transporting mass goods, but it still does um, emit a lot of CO two. So there is a colossal amount of work going on in that space at the moment. I'll be honest. Um, our engineering team in shipping is um, is pretty much deluged with ways of of making ourselves more efficient, uh, reducing our emissions, and fuels and other means of propulsion are all part and parcel of that um so yes I, it will it will change and it will change the industry substantially over the next few years There's, there is no doubt about that um but i think it's it's not only will it be a good change but it'll be a very exciting change as well for everybody because you know we're, we're going to be moving into doing things that we've not done before and trying things that we've never tried before so what's not to like about that? I think it's um, really exciting times, actually. Cool, thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, are the ship's crews encouraged to take part in continuous professional development? Uh, yeah, um, we do. Uh, we have a lot of computer-based training on board that we have to keep up to date and current. Um, it has sort of timelines on, so uh, after a certain, I think it's a couple of years, you go through and do that again, so it makes sure that you're up to date. All of our firefighting, our STCW courses, uh, we have to redo every uh, five years to make sure that we're up to date with that, that we're picking up on new sort of safety, safety aspects. Um, going through the ranks, so to get your next ticket, we're encouraged to um, go back to college and work towards getting the next ticket up. So for the deck side, you get your ticket to become a chief officer and then you'd go back again to become a master. 
and uh, BP will sponsor you through that as well. Um, they'll also, if you're wanting to do a master's or something, they have things in place. Uh, if you want to go back to top up your uh, sort of like your more educational side of things. Um, and they are willing to look at, you can go to them if you're wanting to get experience. Um, so say I wanted to look at, you know, what goes on um, shore side a bit more. I know for the ship operations, I'm able to, uh, pre-COVID, they would arrange for me to go and sort of see what's going on more shore side so that I can get more of an overall um, idea of what goes on sort of on the other side, you know, shore side when we're away on the ship. Cool, thank you very much. Um, okay, well, it looks like sort of questions are fading out now. Um, last chance to ask a question, anyone? I I have one, if you don't mind. Um, no, no, not at all. Just for the cadets themselves, what what makes you pursue this career? What makes it so special for you to do this? What's the most important thing for you as a cadet? Okay, well, I'll, I'll start with that. So for me, uh, what makes me pursue it is it, it's a fairly unique set of um, challenges you face. Um, that you Combinations of um, using your mind and using your hands that you might not get in every other job. You can normally find them uh, one way or the other, but in, in this job as an engineer at sea or, or any of the other roles, yeah, it's a combination of using your mind and, uh, and using your hands, really, you know. For me, that's what I was looking for. For me, it was a choice between uni and doing the cadetship. So I had to weigh up uni. I'd have a lot of student debt, uh, a lot of loans. Whereas doing this, obviously, all my um, cadetships paid for, all my education's paid for, as well as getting a wage, which is really nice. And that's probably the biggest thing for me. any of the other cadets want to chime in? Uh, for me, um, I actually, before I did this, I trained to be a teacher while I was at university. And um, when I was doing my placements, I absolutely hated commuting every day. And it was one of the things that just, I just hated. And I knew that Monday to Friday, nine to five, it just wasn't for me at all. And um, I was actually a member of the university's Royal Naval Unit when I was there and um, just, with that, that opportunity to be able to go to sea, I realised that I liked being on the water and that's what made me then decide to do that. And yeah, so it's, it was the commuting I couldn't, I knew Monday to Friday wasn't for me and I like being able to get away, do my job. And when I come home in my leave period, there's no emails, there's no, you know, my time is my own. I don't have to worry about anything. Um, so I think for me, the main thing was the idea of having three months on and three months off. Uh, so I, I was actually a sea cadet when I was younger. And through that, I found a love for kayaking and uh, teaching people how to kayak. And I thought that this career means I can go away on ship and I can come back and I can spend my three months off kayaking every day. Um, and I can't think of another job where you can do that. Cool. Uh, were any of the other cadets uh, sea cadets as well, or was it just Jess? No, I was a sea cadet. Yeah, Romsey in Southampton. Cool. Uh, so one sort of question. Um, someone said, "Great unit." Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, what's how much, is there a sort of limit to how much personal items you can bring and what sort of stuff do you guys take with you? It's quite important to take on the ship. Well, we're allowed 40 kilos of baggage, um, split between two bags normally, but it depends on the airline. Um, 
important things to me is uh, just stuff to keep you sane, really. Um, again, it seems like a common common thing. Um, normally take a few sweets, depending on if it's like Easter coming up. Uh, take a few bit, a few cream eggs, put them in a the bar uh, for people just to treat them, keep the sm uh, spirits up. Um, as I said before, I've got a, a little Nintendo Switch, which I always bring along, because again, it's just fun to keep, uh, keep the morale up on board ship. Um, and then other than that, it's just toiletries. You have to remember your uniform. Um, and yeah, it's just other than that, just pack for a long holiday. That's all I can really say. Cool. Uh, well, I think that pretty much brings us to the end. Uh, I'd just like to say a massive thank you for all of our panelists, um, from everyone at the Sea Cadets. Um, I learned a lot. I hope everyone watching did. Um, does anyone have anything they want to say? Um, there's a little bit of parting wisdom. Um, I think just as you guys are all sea cadets, I think that um, you're in such a great position. You've got so many opportunities open to you that will open up your career. Uh, I know obviously at the minute the coronavirus is happening, but as soon as the world opens up again, jump on every course you can you'll never get the chance to go on tall ships for as cheap as you can with the sea cadets you'll never be able to do as many of the things you can with the sea cadets in the real world so yeah you guys are, and if you do apply good luck with your application Well, there were some fantastic questions there. Um, thank you ever so much for throwing all of those interesting questions at us. Um, I'll tell you what, there's a lot that I learned tonight as well. So I've been making copious notes. Um, and to all the panelists, thank you again for, uh, for I guess, raising your head above the parapet to, to help out and, and answer all of those questions. It really is appreciated. Hopefully it's given you a bit of a, an opening into what life at sea as a cadet might be. Um, um, and, you know, for anyone who, who does want to pursue it, we are recruiting at the moment. If you go to the um, bp.com forward slash cadets dash UK, then uh, our applications are open until the, uh, the 14th of February. But um, whatever career you decide to choose, um, good luck. It sounds like you're getting some great experience with the Sea Cadets, um, but thank you for joining us this evening and, and for, your, for your interest in, in the cadetships at BP. Okay, yeah, so thanks very much guys for joining. Thanks to all our panelists and yeah, have a, um, enjoy the rest of your evening everyone. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a good evening. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.